Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Board of Directors meeting of HART, Thursday, November 16, 2023. We're pretty good. It's 8.35 a.m. I'll begin first by taking the roll. Kika Kalski. Present. Anthony Alto. Okay, I see you. I, I, can, I can read your lips. Anthony is present. By the way, Anthony is doing his duty from Spain. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, Don Takeuchi Puna is excused. Michelle Chan Brungrapper, present. Nandi Iwasa, she hasn't dialed in, so she's excused. Roger Morton, present. Joe O'Donnell is excused. Ed Sniffen, excused. Art Tontero, excuse. Edwin Wong, Young, sorry. Here, present. Robert Yu. Present. And the chair is here. We have um, a quorum, so we will begin. Uh, first of all, is there anyone who has testimony to offer on any matter on the agenda? Anyone? Anyone calling in or emailing? So we will begin and we'll call for testimony at the start of each agenda item. We'll begin with agenda item number three, which is the executive di uh, director and CEO update. Anyone here to testify on that agenda item? No online and no emails. So I assume that, Rick, you're going to do this? I want to do this. Okay, so the so first item Lori, is... Lori's yeah. traveling this week and so she's missing today's meeting. Um, the first item to cover is the FFGA update. The last time we talked about the FFGA, we talked about the next steps. At that point, it was at the administrator's office at the FTA. After her review, it was going to Secretary Buttigieg's office at Department of Transportation. He would have a 30-day window, his team would, to sign off. Then it would be going to Congress for a 30-day period of time then it would be ready for everyone to sign off. And at that time, the FTA was pushing for a December 31 sign off. Since that time, we've had numerous conversations, uh, especially over the last several days, trying to uh, understand the status of this. Our understanding is it did go from the administrator's office to the secretary's office. We think that was on December, or excuse me, November 8. So technically, they would have until December 8 to turn it around. The FTA asked for an expedited review of that document. They're hoping to get it before the end of November, but we don't know at this point. We originally understood that when it went to the secretary's office, that we would receive a confidential copy of the document that we could share with the part board pig. That changed and they said that we would not be getting a copy until after it came back from the secretary's office. And interesting, they also said we would receive a confidential copy after it came back from the secretary's office. So we've gone back and forth with them several times trying to get clarity on when will we have a document that we can actually share. And we haven't gotten a good answer on that. We think that once it goes to Congress, at this point, once it goes to Congress, a few days after that, we will have a version that we can share. So right now, the timing is still up in the air. They were pushing, as I mentioned, for a December 31 sign-off. When we talked to them last week, they all acknowledged, we knew your timeline was tight. Now we understand it's really tight. We understand it probably won't get done in December. I think my reading between the lines, I think they would still like for it to get done in December, but I just don't know if that's possible mainly from city council perspective. City council's only meeting in December is on December 6th, and we're closing in on that pretty rapidly now. Chair Waters would like to take it to committee before to full council, so I don't see any way we can get that done until January. But once we get the document, or once we know better when we will get the document, uh, the wheels will start turning. Um, one thing that we need to do when we get that document is we need to do our own internal review and have CORE review that document. Um, recall that we haven't seen the document since May. So we want to make sure that 
There's nothing in it that we find prob problematic or anything in it that's a surprise to us. We don't anticipate that to be the case, but we haven't seen the document. So when we get the document, we'll begin our review. We will immediately get in touch with chair and try to lay out the plan for, okay, what's the best way to get it in front of the board? At that point, do we need to go to the pig? If it's an open document, maybe so, maybe not. But we'll talk through the options and the timing on that. And then we'll also be in touch with Chair Waters to talk about when we can get it in front of the council. So that's the update at this point. Uh, are there any questions? Any questions, members? I Roger. Question is best for you, Chair, or for Rick, but when it goes to Congress, uh, where does it go? Does it go to both the House and the Senate? Does it go to committee? Or, or, or who looks at it in Congress? Is it just posted? I think it's just posted. That's my understanding. So there's no affirmative action that needs to be taken by Congress or a negative action. It's just, here it is. So it's, it's upon anybody in Congress who I believe at that point would like to challenge or do anything that they would have to generate something. I see. And by December, they'll all be gone. <laughs> so I doubt we'll have anything. Kathleen, do you have anything different? To add to that, <coughs> the question is regarding when it goes to Congress, what happens? I think it just sits for 30 days. Um, Kathleen Kelly, Deputy Corporation Counsel, it is just a notification. And if I recall correctly, I'll have to confirm. But I think it's um, maybe the transportation subcommittee of the appropriations committee that requires the notice um but i can confirm that but there's no affirmative up or down it's just Correct. it gets there and then it's up to event of course if any member of congress or the member of the senate wants to take issue with it they can generate whatever they want but like i said it's december <laughs> and and they have more pressing matters, like whether or not we're going to need another CR. So it's, it's a major issue. But I, I, I think that, no, there's nothing affirmative at that point. And, and the uh, uh, action is not dependent upon the CR because it's all old uh, appropriations? No. And matter of fact, that's what the CR does, right? It ex the continuing resolution by resolution continues the prior budget cycle. So that's why it's, it doesn't need anything else as long as it was there before which it was and the CR doesn't exempt it out it will continue any do you have anything different no Anthony any questions thank you chair no okay anyone else yes Michelle yes yeah, so it sounds like December 31st is probably um, especially because it has to go through Congress that's not going to fly. So is there a replan in terms of just pushing it out like maybe a month so that people can plan travel and plan all that other stuff because they want to come out here and sign it, right? Well, I think we can't really finalize the schedule until we know when we're going to get it. But yeah, right now it's likely to be, in my opinion, into January. Yeah, the uh, council committee meetings are yeah. middle of January. The council meeting is the 24th. So my thinking on a timeline at this point would be yeah. board meeting on the 14th of December, council committees mid-January, yeah. council 24th of January, and then be ready to sign Well, this the is week the only thereafter. time we're going to talk about it before next month. So my suggestion would be that, you know, we look at offering that to them to see if we can make it and then just track the milestones to make sure that it gets to Congress in the beginning of December. And then if it does, then, then, then that looks like that would be pretty achievable, right? And then when we get that document, hopefully when it, at the very latest, when it goes to Congress, right? Um, then, then we would be able to review it um, at, the, at the board meeting in December. So- That's what I'm anticipating. And yeah. once we get the document, no, when we, when we will get it, we'll coordinate okay. that with chair and with okay. board and council chair. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Roger, do you have something? Your your light is on. Oh. But but uh, Rick, 
the the bottom line is it's really uh, in Secretary Buttigieg's area now. So he can, as soon as he releases to Congress, it becomes public. So if he were to release tomorrow, for example, it would be public. Right. And then we can start our process. And we can, the uh, you know, it may be a special board meeting if necessary, but we can assist council chair in meeting his timeline as long as he's willing to bypass transportation and and, and or transportation is willing to have a special meeting on it but i think at that point we'll be we'll be okay and i don't think it sounds to me like i don't think we're going to need the pig unless for some reason they change their position between now and whenever the secretary releases that we in fact can have a confidential copy right so i guess there's I thank kathleen too she spent a lot of time on this over the past week she's been working with the fda's legal counsel and i've been working with the fda office out of san francisco trying to and then we've been comparing stories as to what we've been hearing in terms of the status uh, so thanks to you for the work that you've done on this but you're exactly right. We could get it today. We don't know. Mm -hmm. They could send it today. They could send it early next week, or it could be early December. We don't know. If we got it within the next few days, then yes, then we need to have a discussion with Chair Waters and see if he would bypass committee. If we got it within the next few days, we could potentially meet a December sign off. So we would need the to secretary it. does have it though. Buddha judge does have it. Yeah. So if he, if he, ha so the time frame is is basically either in the rules or statutorily. It's thirty days that he has to review it, and it has to go to Congress. So once we know when it's triggered, we we know that it's falling into it's line. The wheels turning. Yeah. Yeah. And Tommy did want to take it to committee, but if he would bypass, we could either have a special board meeting or we have committee meetings on December 1st, I think. Right. We could have a meeting right after that. Um, and then it could get posted prior to that for council and it could go to council on January, on December 6th, theoretically. But it all depends upon when we get it and we need to do a review of it, so. It's my understanding of Sunshine is that if we, the document itself can be couple of days is 48 hours before the actual meeting the posting is six days so we would post that we would have it but the the actually release of the document doesn't have to come for 48 hours before the actual notice meeting i don't want the public to think hey what what happened to sunshine how come they can do this it is because in the sunshine law it is anticipated okay anyone else yes roger just one, uh, given the uh, the rate of communications and everything, I assume that we're keeping Senator Schatz uh, up to date. He is kept um, council, mayor's office, and Senator Schatz's office all informed on the status. In fact, um, Senator Schatz's office has been kind of helping run lead on some of this. Yep. Okay. Anyone else? No? Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kathleen. Monthly update on critical position recruitment. Yeah, the next item is under Roman Batching Report. Um, this is monthly update of open recruitment. There are two items on here that have been filled. Um, you met Corey Ellis last mm -hmm. month, one of the meetings. Um, took the position of director of project control. So we'll take that item off going forward. And then we have an IT support technician getting work. So we're happy about that. The other recruitments are still ongoing. Um, we do have the board staff assistant up here. We put that on hold for the time being until we make progress on the board officer. Is that the reason we want to stay? Mm -hmm. um, the still so members, um, any questions on this item? Michelle, you got any questions? This is your request, if I recall. No, I don't have a question. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? You know, Rick, some of these positions have been going for vacant for quite a while. 
like one for 234 days as of the chart date, 175 days, 271 days. Project controls was vacant for 166 days. I guess the concern that I have is, you know, how do we function? You know, are these positions being backfilled by uh, HDR or someone like that? Or some yeah, entity? About people within the departments, the secretary position is the one that's the most aged. Um, we actually had a person, we made an offer on that a couple of weeks ago, and the person declined the offer. Um, in fact, we had two secretarial offers out within the last month, and we had two declines. So we continue to recruit. We do have a hard time filling. Um, the construction claim specialist is an engineer. Um, that one has been, we have other people in the claims group that are filling that, but that is a position that would be helpful to have filled. But just as a aside, Roger and I were in mayor's cabinet yesterday and they was, HR director from the city was talking about engineering jobs across the city. And 40% of the engineering jobs across the city are vacant and they're having a hard time filling. So that's one we just haven't been able to find a candidate for. Um, it's a very competitive market in some of these positions. Do they have uh, any idea as to why? Is it the pay scale? They necessarily talk about, the well, they talk about, but they have been collaborating with, I think, the Bloomberg group and different people around the city who are looking to hire engineers and trying to develop a plan around that. So we want to tap into that group and make sure that we are part of that. Um, but salary was certainly one of the things that they mentioned. For example, yes. three of our engineers were. Mike, Mike. Sorry. Three of our engineers were poached by the federal government for the shipyard. Uh, and I think other, other departments, it's the same story, is that the compensation is much higher. Uh, they, uh, they provide them with a flexible uh, working arrangement. They have a lot of them work at home because they don't have space on base. Uh, and so when you put all those factors together, uh, it's very attractive for engineers to, uh, even if they like the city, it's just, you know, they make an offer they can't refuse. Okay. Any any other questions? Yes. Hey, um, if any of the critical positions, and it seems unlikely, but if any of the critical decisions could be fully remote, records management, maybe I don't know. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Um, if, if people love working remote, yeah. and we could hire somebody from anywhere, really, right? Yeah, if you can do that. that, we don't have to move them. We can hire them. They sit at home. They video in. I love doing that. We all love doing that. So, you know, maybe take a look and and maybe even take a look at if you could be part-time remote because then you have to only come into the office. Now, I know that it, for esprit de corps and some other things like that, it's really not optimal. And, it, and you know, it's not really that hard commuting here unless you live in Kapolei, um, at which point you would love to commute <laughs> remotely. So, you know, just take a look at it and see um, that that's an incentive that you might be able to just add to a position that, that doesn't really cost us anything. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Roger. One position I, I don't see on this list that I used to see was a director of safety. Um, I know you use a contract firm. Is that now an ongoing strategy to just use contract firm for that? Um, I think ideally all of our consultants we would like to have as city employees, but we did recruit for that position for quite some time without any success. So we do have a couple of people in the safety roles right now, and they're doing just an incredibly great job. So right now that seems to be a good solution for us. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Rick. Members, um, I'm going to ask for your indulgence at this time. As some of you know, our very conscientious co-member, Anthony, is joining us, but he's in Europe. So because of that, I'm going to move this agenda around, and, the, and it's going to be, it's probably dinner time now. Uh, he has a dinner appointment. So I'm going to move some of the issues that would normally be in his committee uh, and we'll go into executive session. I'll ask for the proper motions, but we'll move them out of order. So with that, um, do, do you know which ones? I think it's definitely the status on uh, Victoria Ward, which we call Howard Hughes, and the, the, the status on Shimmick. 
Yeah. Right. Fun. Those mm -hmm. those those two for sure. Is that okay with you, Roger? I mean, Anthony. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, my apologies uh, and my thanks to my colleagues there. Yeah, that would work well. Yep. Are, are there any of the other items that you would like to um, have input on uh, before you leave us? And the rest are eminent domain issues, the other two. Um, Correct. And, and we've been through those thoroughly uh, in the past, both in public and in executive session. They're kind of pre-cooked as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it's the first two items that you mentioned, Chair, that, that I think um, I, I need to be in on. Thank you. So with that, members, we are going to take out of order, unless any of someone objects, and I don't hear any objections, agenda item number 10, which is the status report on City and County of Honolulu acting by and through the Honolulu Authority for Rapid Transportation versus Victoria Ward Limited. Um, first of all, is there anyone here to testify on that specific agenda item? It is a status. It, probably, it will not include any action on our part, but that's uh, the next agenda item. Anyone here? Hearing none. Any online? No? So, members, we will begin with that. And first of all, um, I assume the status on this, I see Paula Woki walking in. This is on Howard Hughes. Uh, is there anything you want to present publicly or I'm going to move into executive session on status? Uh, if we could do it in the executive session. Okay. Thank you. So members, I would uh, entertain a motion to enter into executive session pursuant to Hawaii Revised Statute Section 92-4, subsection 92A3, to deliberate concerning the authority of persons designated by the board to conduct labor negotiations or negotiation the acquisition of public property or doing the conduct of such negotiations of subsection 92-5A4 to consult with its attorneys on questions and issues on matter pertaining to the board's powers, duties, privileges, immunities, and liabilities. May I have uh, such a motion? Sure, if I may. Yes. Sorry. Um, I know normally we do each executive session separately, but given the logistics with Olelo going in and out, um, and given that both of these are updates from attorneys, I think the board could, if it wanted to, just have one executive session to do 10 and 11 together. The only question I have is, do we have different attorneys for 10 and 11? Same attorneys doing the update for 10 and 11? Mr. Smith is here? Yeah. I think they're different, Chair. They're different attorneys? But who's going to do executive session today? Is it you, Paul? I know that O'Toole's in D.C. or something. He's not here, right? I'm here for the Howard Hughes case. You are here for the, who's here for Shimek? That's, oh, it's just you and Kathleen? Okay. Yeah. So Kathleen is also here for Howard Hughes too, Kathleen? No? Okay. Yeah, so we could just excuse the Howard Hughes attorneys after their presentation and then. And what about on. Kathleen and uh, Nate and, and Lex? We're going to excuse them now yeah, and then have them coming in? Yeah, I mean, Kathleen can stay if you'd like her. Right. Um, but Nate right. can come in at STG. Okay. Just so that we're okay. So the recommendation, members, is that we take the two uh, status reports uh, by one motion. And then what we do is we um, ask the attorneys to go in and out. And this way, we don't have to mess up Olelo unnecessarily. Is there any objection to that? No? OK, that's what we're going to do. So the first uh, item 10 is what I read what the motion would be. The second item, 11, is the status report on Shimmick Taylor Granite, or STG, Joint Venture versus Honolulu Authority for Rapid Transportation et al. And um, this will also entertain uh, uh, an executive session pursuant to Hawaii Revised Statute Section 92-4 and subsection 92-5A4 to consult with its attorneys on questions and issues on matters pertaining to the board's positions, duties, privileges, immunities, and liabilities. So may I have, um, first of all, is there anyone here to testify on 
item number 11, which is the, uh, the Shimek status. No. How about online? No. So, members, now that you're thoroughly confused, I need a motion for both agenda item number 10, 11 as read. Um, can I have that motion to go into executive session for those reasons? Thank you, Edwin. Second. second. And second. second by Robert. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, I assume we have unanimous consent. We're okay with Anthony. So with that, uh, we are going to move into executive session. Olelo will do their thing. Anyone who is not here, an, an attorney, or a member of our staff that we need to get information from on the quote Howard Hughes matters will ask you to leave and uh, we'll call you back in when, for those who are relevant to agenda item number 11. Okay. Thank you, and welcome back uh, to the public for, this is the Board of Directors meeting of Thursday, November 16, 2023, of the executive session on, on items 10 and 11, and uh, what, what occurred in that executive session is that the board was apprised of recent developments by our attorneys and uh, we have uh, given our attorneys settlement authority. So that's uh, the summary. And with that, I welcome Natalie. Natalie is, is there. And thank you, Chair. STG and uh, both 10 and 11. Okay. Now, I see Natalie, board member Natalie Iwasa is, is, on, is online. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'm sorry, were you able to hear me? I, I can't tell. Can you folks hear sorry. me? Sorry, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear yes, me? All right? We can hear you, Natalie. Okay, okay thank you. Flipping off. All right, so Natalie is online, but what I was doing was apologizing to you, Natalie, because there are lawyers in the audience, and so I'm intending to take resolution, uh, agenda item number eight, Eight, uh, which is the approval of the amendment domain of the, uh, I think this is the Takara property, and nine, which is resolution 2023-9, and this is the um, notice of the city council to of intent to acquire. I'm not sure that we will go into executive session on those two items, but because of the presence of the attorneys, I am going to take those two items next and out of order. Members, is there any objection to us doing that? Hearing none, we'll begin with um, agenda item number eight. First of all, this is the resolution 2023-5, approving the acquisition by eminent domain and of for full fee simple interest in the real property identified as tax map key 11-2-003-118 and 11-2-0001 as located at 1829 Dillingham Boulevard, Honolulu, Hawaii, 96819 and owned by Janine Hatsue Takara, formerly known as Hatsue Takara, as successor trustee of the Walter S. Takara Revocable Trust dated June 13, 1992, with full power to sell, mortgage, lease, or otherwise deal with land. And Janine Hatsue Takara, formerly known as Hatsue Takara, trustee of the Hatsue Takara Revocable Trust dated June 13, 1992, with full power to sell, mortgage, lease, or otherwise deal with the land as tenants in common. Members, we have had this issue before us uh, before. Uh, so with that, I would like to have Corporation Counsel or the attorney, is this you, Lex, come forward and uh, brief the board. And I'm not sure that we need to go into executive session. So why don't we begin with you? 
And, and Krista? Yes, but, Chair. Krista, are you involved with this? Yes, I am. Okay, and also by way of virtual uh, participation is Krista Lunger. So with that, please begin. I think Krista actually is much more knowledgeable than I am at this point. Okay. She's there. There have been, I, I would expect the questions would be how are negotiations going? And Krista has been handling all of that. There's no loss yet, obviously, so I'm less involved at this point. So this is on a Takara property. Correct. Right? That's so correct. We are asking or well, Krista, why don't you tell us what by way of introduction and I see you have a um, a slide presentation. So why I don't do you begin? Thank you. Can you hear me okay? You have to get closer to your mic. You're going okay, in and can, out. Can you hear me okay? You're kind of faint. Mm. How about now? Yeah, you're fine now. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Um, Krista Lunzer, Director of Transit Property Acquisition and Relocation, here today to ask for permission to proceed with filing an eminent domain action against um, the Takara property so that we can acquire that property in fee simple. I do have a, a quick presentation, um, which we had given back, but just as a refresher as to what um, the property is, is for. Um, if someone can advance the slide, please. Um, you'll see that there's a map of the property um, and it shows that the property is going to be used um, largely to hold the um, facilities necessary to power the station that will be um, on the property um, across the street from this one. Um, so it is needed for the project. Um, next slide, please. As some background, um, we originally began working on this property in 2014, which was a full acquisition after some um, negotiations and a rejection of the original offer, they did uh, heart it, and the owner started talking about a partial acquisition. And for a few years that was um, attempted to be negotiated. However, um, it never was fully agreed to by the owner. In May of 2020, the owner asked Hark to explore possibilities of purchasing the property in, in full. And upon reevaluation, we decided we did need that property um, for a full acquisition. And in 2022, the FTA approved for us to proceed with that. Next slide. The amount of just compensation for the property has been determined according to the Uniform Act. An updated written offer was provided to the owner in October of 2023. The owner has been given a reasonable time to consider the offer. Um, the slide says we have not received a, a counter offer, but we did receive one on no November 2nd, which we are responding to. In order to adhere to the project construction schedule, it's necessary for us to refer the property to condemnation. Efforts will be made to continue to negotiate with the owner. I do want to give a little update about the tenant that occupies the property. This is done with uh, service printers authorization. Typically, we would not discuss uh, relocation matters in public, but we did talk with them and thought it was important to let the board know and the public know the status of the service printers relocation. So they are a tenant business that occupy the Takara property. It will be necessary for them to vacate the site upon acquisition of the property for the HRTP. As such, service printers will be eligible for relocation benefits in according to the Uniform Act. Service Printers has identified a replacement property and is currently working to modify the site to accommodate their property and equipment. Service Printers anticipates moving in the spring of 2024 without any interruption of its business operations. And that's my public presentation. Thank you. Do um, you, Lex, or Shell have anything to add? I have nothing to add. Nothing further. Members, any questions? Um, yes. Question, Chair. Thank you. Um, Krista, could, could you um, just expand on your point about in order to adhere to the project construction schedule, at what point will, will not getting this property affect the uh, construction schedule? We're getting about to the point where that's going to have an impact. So the property um, needs to be vacant of the tenant and then needs to be demolished. And so we 
cannot issue a 90 day notice to vacate to the tenant until Hart has possession of the property. We still need to file the condemnation, get possession before we can do that. They would like to start with the with the demolition activities early next summer. So the current schedule of the tenant moving out in May works fine. Um, but we're right about that at that point where if we do not proceed, we are going to start impacting construction. Okay, so basically the deadline is um, next summer. If this thing doesn't get done um, by next summer, then it will start impacting the construction schedule. Correct? No, I would, I would say if it doesn't get done within the next month or two, um, because again, we need to have the ability to provide a notice to vacate to the owner, which we can't do till we have possession by the court. And then we need to demolish the oh, yeah, property right. and they need to vacate. So there's things that need to happen before that, that demolition date is next summer. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. No, no, they you wanted... were. I, um, okay. It's the way I asked the question. Yes, I understand. Okay, okay. Thanks, thank Krista. you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Roger. Um, I, I saw on the site plan that HECO, HECO has a transformer on the site. Is that, uh, is that a system owned equipment or is that really a HECO owned equipment? So HECO, there's going to be a 138 kV pole um, on the site. And then the transformer will be for, um, it's my understanding it's to power the station. Yeah, and it, does that um, mean that HECO will use that transformer for potentially for other customers or would it be exclusively for HART? My understanding is exclusively for HART. Okay, thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Yes, Chair, Natalie. Yes, Natalie. Uh, I guess just a couple technical issues regarding the um, resolution because it states that the board executive officer is directed to transmit copies to corporation council and then the attest block states that it's um, the board executive officer who's going to sign it. So just uh, wondering whether that needs to be changed in the resolution or not. Corporation Council, would you like to respond to that? Um, who is the current board officer at this point? Is it? We don't have a board officer right now. Okay. Um, has there anyone been signing for in that, in lieu of that? Okay. Well, I do notice that on the resolution approving it, it is me who's signing. We can change. And, but it's attested by the board executive officer. I guess we could ask you to attest. Um, I, I suppose. Um, I, mean, I don't even know what you need an attestation. I mean, if it's signed by the chair, it's just an extra level of security. But I, I don't know. I don't. I don't think the resolution will fail if we don't have an attestation from the officer. Um, but we could, I mean, if there is someone with authority within HART to do that, um, we could replace the name. But in lieu of that, I don't see a resolution failure from not having that attestation. The resolution to me is just saying that this was adopted by the board and I'm signing it as the board chair. And I guess is the attest attestation, the fact that it is my signature, you guys drafted this because if it's my signature, why can't we do that by way of, uh, um, uh, basically having notary someone notarize it. And that mm -hmm. would be the same thing if the attestation that you guys drafted, this mm -hmm. is your draft, that you guys drafted is an attestation of my signature versus an attestation that the board, in fact, enacted this resolution, which I'm saying, yeah. I'm saying that this is what was approved. So this goes back to you guys at CORE mm -hmm. as to what was intended with the attestation. Because I, I also think that when there is a certified copy, there is um, that attestation of whether or not that's the correct resolution. So I do think that it is vital, but I 
Now, what I, are you attesting to? That's my fundamental question. What are you attesting to? Well, what is it that the board executive officer is attesting to? Is it attesting to the fact that it's my signature, like you would with a notary statement? Or are you attesting to the fact that it was passed by the board, which I am basically doing by saying that the... Chair, I'm not sure which of those or if it's both of them, um, but I would think that uh, since I, I am acting as the board's attorney and therefore as a representative of the board, I think I could probably sign it. Um, so maybe that'll solve the problem. And, um, I would have normally asked you to do that, except that I do want to know what the attestation is for. What are you attesting to? What is the board executive officer attesting to? And like I said, this is a core document, so core should know what they're, attest what they're asking us to attest to. I would say that the attestation is to the passing of the resolution, not just your signature. Because I think the passing of the resolution would include your signature. <laughs> no, but I'm signing. I'm right. signing that it was adopted Correct. by the board. So I'm attesting to the fact that this was, this was, this was basically adopted by this board. So then you have another attestation. So what is that attestation so for? I would argue that your your signature is the approval, right. and that the attestation is that the board actually did approve that this is the re this is the actual resolution that was passed and that that your board your signature approves this particular resolution and that the attestation from the board officer is that it actually happened and that it it, it was passed in the way that it was passed so for example in this under this agenda in the way in proper sunshine law so, so maybe maybe the resolution to this issue is going to be if you core and take out the executive officer and put in the fact that the board's attorney uh, by attest by signing under at the attestation below is certifying that whatever it is that you think that attestation stands for. In other words, number five changes so that it becomes a different document. The, the, I know that you guys just do these documents as a matter of course, but this is a different situation. So if you can't tell me what that attestation is for, then you're gonna have to change the body and make that attestation relevant to whatever you think it's for. I, I think she's right, and I think it's in lieu of having every board member sign it, right. which is what other boards can do. Well, do you want every board member to sign it? If that's, is that the other course of action that you do for Corporation Council? All I'm asking for is, you guys draft this document. What does it mean? I mean, I admit that the attestation literally just says attest, and it does not further describe right. what you're attesting to. Um, we can clarify that, and we can make it robust. I don't think we need to add every signature for by the, by the, um, by the board. I think the board chair is sufficient, um, and we can change that attestation going forward. So what I'm proposing that you, we, if we pass this resolution, which you're asking for today, is that you amend it, a friendly amendment, uh, mm -hmm. paragraph five, and you put in there that the attestation will be by the board's attorney who is attesting to the fact that this was official action by the, the Hart Board on the date so noted below, or something like that. Would that do, or would that satisfy your attestation? I believe so, Chair. I personally don't even know why you need it, but it's there, mm -hmm. so I guess we have to address it. I think, you know, 
I think the normal course would be that I'm the one verifying that this was adopted and that you would need to verify that it's me who signed it. And that's why I proposed a notary statement. But anyway, I think that other one will. I think actually we may be able to make it simpler, Chair, if we just cross out board executive officer at the bottom and just write in deputy corporation counsel and I can sign it. And then paragraph five, we can just make it passive tense and say um, this resolution shall be transmitted to Harvard Department of Corporation Counsel. Um, and I'll make sure that that happens. Okay. So we won't say that the board attorney has been directed that's fine yeah you could do that, that yeah. the board's attorney yeah okay you all right krista mm -hmm. any problems no i believe i'm clear thank you okay thank you natalie for catching that any anything else anyone else I do not believe we need to go into executive session on this. I think we've had enough executive sessions on this specific issue. The only question that I have, and, and I could be getting this mixed up with um, another condemnation. Are we, Krista, is selling this to HECO in the long run, or is HECO acquiring this property from us, from Hart? No, so Hart will retain this property. However, we will be granting HECO a, an, an easement on the property where they will be placing a 138 KV pole. So just a portion will have an, an easement and we'll come back to the board for disposition as we have done in the past once we acquire the property. And like we have acquired, um, and, and we will put in this, the usual provision that we do with HECO, which is that it's non-exclusive and that we retain, the board retains the right to control the yes. property, right? Yes, that is correct because we will be the underlying fee owner of the property. We can do that, yes. Well, is that it us or is it the city? Well, I'm sorry, the city, yes. Yeah. The but city and county. We, but we control the, the easement use. That, that's correct. Okay. Yep. Members, any other questions? If not, I believe we are going to need a motion um, for the adoption of the resolution 2023-5 uh, as with that amendment noted in the resolution. So moved, Chair. Yeah. Moved and seconded, Robert Jew and Edwin Young. Okay. Members, any discussion? If not, do we have unanimous consent? We do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lex. <laughs> okay, now we're going to go to resolution number nine, uh, agenda item number nine, resolution 2023 9, approving notification to the city and county of intention to acquire by eminent domain an easement in the real property identified as tax map key number 1 1 2 2. 012-013 located at 610 Pool Holly Road, Honolulu, Hawaii 96819 and owned by TNI Properties 1 LLC. Now, anyone here to testify on agenda item number nine? Anyone online? Nope. So thank you. Are we going to go with you, Krista, or Lindsay, or Michelle? I think we should start with Krista. I think she's a public presentation. Okay. Krista. Thank you, Chair. Uh, next slide, please. So here we show a map of the easement area. Um, it is along the... Um, entrance to the property. Um, the easement is... Un, it's a below surface easement with a manhole at the surface. It does not have rights to have things above ground, so there will be no um, nothing impeding access to the property. Um, next slide. At the committee meeting um, back in September, there were questions about how the undergrounding was going to tie in to the above ground. So I do have an electrical plan that I've added to the to the presentation here, and as you can see. Um, it will come from the transformer underground 
There will be a line that goes across the street of Pool Halle, and then it will join um, into the pole that is above ground across the street from the property. So that is how it goes from below ground to above ground. Next slide, please. It's necessary to relocate utilities along the Dillingham Corridor in preparation for construction of the, the transit project. This includes undergrounding the 138 kV line that is currently overhead. Heart requires, um, yeah, Heart requires an easement across the subject property to accommodate the relocation of the 138 kV. The easement is needed for placement of an underground utility line, including a manhole for maintenance purposes. Hart is acquiring the property rights pursuant to the Hart and HECO Utility Inspection and Property Transfer Agreement dated May 16th, 2018 for the airport guideway and city center section. Next slide, please. The amount of just compensation for the property has been determined according to the URA. Hart presented an offer to acquire a non-exclusive electrical easement to the owner um, of the property in March of 2023. The owner rejected the offer. Um, in order to adhere to the project construction schedule, it's necessary to refer the property to condemnation. Efforts will be made to continue negotiations with the owner um, with the goal of reaching an amicable settlement. Next slide, please. The eminent domain approval process upon passing of this resolution, we will notify the city council of our intent of heart's intent to acquire the property by eminent domain. The city council will have 45 days to approve or object to the condemnation. Um, they do have the right also to take no action. Upon approval or no action by the city council, the board of directors will be requested to approve a resolution authorizing the acquisition of the property by eminent domain. And that's just an easement. It's not the full property for clarification. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Oh, before that, anyone? Lindsay, Michelle, do you have anything to add? Nothing to add to the presentation. Nothing for me. Thank you. Nothing? Okay. Any questions by members of the board? Uh, yes. Natalie. Oh, okay. Natalie, I'm take Michelle first and then I'll get to you. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment that, you know, I mean, we prefer not to get to this point it's to stay on schedule. We've gotten briefed on some of these projects many, many times. And um, and, and of course, we will continue to negotiate with the, the owners, but I did want to kind of put in a plug that, you know, the preference is really not to go to eminent domain. The, the, the point is to try to work out an equitable settlement, and we'll continue to try to do that. We just got to keep us ourselves on schedule. Um, so if you're just only following now, we have gotten many briefs on um, both mm -hmm. this one and the, the, previous, um, the previous topic. Thank you. Natalie? Uh, yeah, thank you. So um, I'm just curious now on the assignment, is HECO going to reimburse for any of the acquisition costs on this? That's the first thing. And then the second thing is, again, the attest block here says board executive officer. To answer your first question, um, no, HECO will not be reimbursing for any costs. There is an agreement in place that says that HART is responsible for all land acquisition necessary for the project and so that this that includes this easement so there will not be a reimbursement and then i do understand that we will need to make the same changes to the resolution as we just discussed with the previous resolution thank you krista thank you thank you, thank you. any other questions yes roger so I, I, as i understand it uh after this is done there'd be no impact to access to the property it's all underground uh, during construction, uh, is there impact? I mean, what impact is there during construction and, and uh, how long is that anticipated to be? So during construction, the work can be done in the evening hours. Um, I believe that um, there's been a couple of meetings with the owner and the construction manager to talk about what that schedule should look like. Um, it should be in the evening after 8 p.m. and before 4 a.m. I believe the work is to take place over a two to three week period if by chance they need access and while the work is happening, they can put down a steel plate and a truck can access the, the um, delivery bay and then can can move forward. So um, there has been a couple of coordination meetings and there will be more when the work is actually being done. Uh, do, do, do we have a, a right of entry pending uh, condemnation action? Right now, there is no right of entry for this property. The owner has not signed one.
Anyone else? Krista, um, yes. what does TNI do or what is the property used for now? Um, they are a um, supplier. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm Spring Supply, I believe is the name of the company. And, and they are a supplier of goods. I don't know for what purpose. You know, uh, in your attachment, you have um, basically two resolutions. One is identified as just with no exhibit number. And one is exhibit C. Exhibit C is a lot longer than the first resolution. So exhibit C is what we will come back to the board with when the time comes to ask for approval to actually file the action. So it's it's an attachment to the current resolution that, that is not an exhibit. It's an, it's a, the exhibit C is an attachment to that. And that at this time, we're not asking you to approve that. That's when we come back um, after providing council with their notification. So you're asking, because I noticed that we don't have an exhibit C for the one we just did for the uh, Takara property. That's but, because, I'm sorry. No, so it's, but you do have one for the TNI property and exhibit C. So for Takara, when we came to you the first time, the resolution that you just passed was exhibit C. And now that we've come back to you a second time for the actual approval, that exhibit C has become the main resolution and the exhibit goes away and it's now the resolution. So that will happen for this as well. Right now it's it's just an exhibit, just part of the, the piece of, of documentation. But when we come back to you, it becomes the resolution that you will pass. Krista, what you're missing is that there's a difference in the resolution. So the resolution on the Takara property looks like the resolution with no exhibit number in terms of the TNI property. However, the exhibit C, which you said you're going to come back with, is a, lo a longer resolution than exhibit the one without an exhibit number, which you said was was exhibit C in the Takara property. So and if, so I, if I may, um, Krista, yes. I'll just it's just a refresher on the, the process that we have to go through for for um, condemnation approval. So there's three steps. The first is to go to the board for approval to send the list of properties or or notify the city council right. of this. So that is the first part of this resolution. And it's just basically saying um, okay, Hart, you are okay to send this to City Council. Then we send the resolution to City Council. It goes through their own committee, EMLA committee, and then it goes to City Council. And they have 45 days. If within 45 days they don't approve or they just um, don't have any action, it comes back to the board. And that's where Exhibit C is triggered. So for Takara, we were on the th that third level. So that's why you see Exhibit C as the resolution, because, because we were on the final approval. I understand the process. What okay. I'm saying is that your Exhibit C for TNI, which is supposed to be the resolution that we passed for <laughs> Takara, looks more like the Takara resolution, looks more like the one that we're passing, you're asking us to pass, which is a notification. I'm just asking you why the difference in the two resolutions, the exhibit C. If you if you look at your yeah, exhibit C, yes, in this you can notice I it's, it's almost, well, with the attestation, the famous attestation, it's, it's three pages. Whereas the CARA, it's really just one page plus a little bit more. I see. Um, okay, Chair, this is this is one of those properties where it's a HECO, um, it's one of those HECO acquisitions in which we are going to dispose of the property through an assignment. So as you noted from the first, the That's first what I thought. part, when we went through TNI, mm -hmm. um, the TNI committee, we did go through that conversation about the drafting of the resolution. Um, and I also think we need to bring to your attention that there are some edits to 
to the resolution that we've made post committee. Um, are you talking about Exhibit C or are you talking about both? Both. Both. And um, we have discussed whether or not we should bring this back to committee to bring back to you. Um, but we thought we'd just move forward with the with the bigger board and talk about those changes. They're not, um, so yes, you are correct that these are different resolutions um, from from uh, Takara, because Takara is if we take that heart will maintain right. a heart and the city. Right. These are HECO, um, for HECO acquisitions. So TNI, TNI is the one that I recall that we are giving it to HECO after, after we condemn it, right? Correct. So we're condemning it, and then we're going to turn it over to HECO. So it seems like Natalie's question now becomes relevant, which is, is there compensation for this? I think Krista had answered that. No, I mean, this is, you're returning over property. This is different than an easement. This is returning over the property, as I recall it, from the previous discussions on TNI. It will be an doing? easement. We'll be assigning the easement to HECO. It's not a fee interest with TNI. It's still an easement, and it will be assigned to HECO. Just like we did with the Takara? Well, with Takara, the difference is, is that we're going to get fee simple interest in the full property. We will never have fee simple interest in the TNI property. We are only going to get easement interest through our condemnation. And so we'll come back to the board and ask for approval to assign our interest to TNI. No, to HECO. I'm sorry, yes. My mistake, to, to HECO. So that we're clear on this. Yes. What you're saying is we're going to, well, first of all, are we acquiring in the TNI the easement? in fee simple or are we just doing an easement in use it's just an easement no it's not fee is it like like with howard hughes it's basically not a fee simple interest in the easement it's an easement in use unless there's a more technical word lindsay than that in in tni all that's being acquired is an easement there's no fee simple interest being acquired so it's very it. similar to what howard hughes has it's an easement in use basically we're just acquiring an easement to use it fast as opposed to a fee simple interest correct right okay so that's in takara we're acquiring the property in fee <laughs> so what we're doing with tni is we're acquiring it and then we're going to assign to hiko is this going to be the same as how we do all other assignments to HECO, Krista? That we maintain control and, and HECO just gets to use it, but we maintain control of the easement? That's not the intent. So that, That's what I thought. This one is different. It's different because all we're, all we're going to acquire, it is a use easement, but it's, it's limited to electrical use. So Hart has, or the city has, not the um, desire so far anyway, to maintain that property in, in any way. We don't wanna retain any rights from, from, from where we are at right now. So we would assign that electrical easement over to HECO. So I understand that there may need to be a, a greater discussion once we get the easement that, that perhaps we wanna try and negotiate with, with, with HECO and make sure that the city wants to maintain some rights so that if we wanted to bring in some sort of alternative energy use that we that we may still be able to do that. Um, but right now the intent is to get that electrical easement so we have possession of it and can move forward with construction. What about liability? If they get the, it's a totally electrical uh, easement, so to speak, what about the liability? Because you know this one goes underneath Puuhale, so you're talking about what I call stepping down into a underground underground line from an overhead line, which always requires some kind of a, a transformer or something. So you, you're stepping it down underneath Puuhale Road into the TNI property. So the liability of doing that. Is that HECO's? 
Once we assign the easement, it will become HECO's responsibility. I'm not responsibility. I'm talking about liability. Liability. They, they will. They would. We'll fully they would assign all of those and the city for everything that happens from the from the pole across the street underground Pu'uhale into the property and whatever else that they use in terms of the HECO easement. Correct. The intent it would be to assign all of those responsibilities to HECO in the assignment. Okay. Any other questions, members? Sure. If yes. I, if I may, I just want to clarify. So what you're asking the board to adopt today is what's listed as resolution 2023-9 in the meeting packet. And what was passed into CAR was 2023-5. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. And is there a six or seven or eight right resolution um, number? Not that they were part of mine. I don't. I don't recall what they may have been. Um, there, there were other items on agendas previous. Okay. Um, if I made sure, if the resolution or if the vote by the board can be that, um, I can renumber this if necessary, and it'll. Uh, I would also suggest the same amendments as to the last one, which is that uh, the attestation we just changed to deputy corporation counsel rather than board executive officer, and it doesn't have a. Uh, does not have that paragraph? I think it doesn't have the other paragraphs. So we should That's why I was confused too. It doesn't have paragraph five. The, the paragraph is actually uh, paragraph six in exhibit C. So we'll need to change it in exhibit C. No, I'm talking about the fact that the the one that you have here that you're asking us to adopt doesn't have that paragraph five that we put into the Takara, or you put into the Takara resolution. Mm -hmm. But the, the resolution C that they have in here is basically the same step of the process as what we just passed, and it does have that language in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, members, any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Just to clarify, so Dan, are you saying you're going to change the the number of the of the or the resolution? Um, so I. <laughs> would like it to be consecutive so that the board's resolutions just come in numerical order. I don't have to, uh, we can just leave it if there is a six or seven or eight somewhere else that's floating around. I just don't know. Yeah, the, I mean, I guess my, maybe if, if you're contemplating that, maybe just verify that there's no other six, seven or eight. No, that's what I was yeah. going to do is to try to figure out. Because I'm not sure if these resos necessarily move in sequence, they might have different time frame so right. yeah so may i may i just um dan when when we put forth the takara thing originally the matter um back in may cindy provided a resolution number two exhibit c which is now what we're talking about today or what we talked about a few minutes ago so that's why the number is is previous to this tni by a couple of numbers i think there was some resolutions between may and september that then when we went for TNI, the next number in order was was nine. So we would we would want to verify that. Yeah, that's fine. We can just leave it at nine. Um and I'll just figure out what we'll just put about. it in the motion that if it's we're sequential and if it's off, you have the authority to change it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And any other questions? Krista, do you have something else? Because your light's on. Okay. Oh. No, I have nothing else. Thank you. Anyone else? Any member? Not. And um, I assume that uh, if we acquire the easement for Pu'uhale Road, that uh, and uh, it is a electrical easement in use, that the usual language that we put in everything that we do with Hiko about the fact that it's non-exclusive will be included. Correct. It's not exclusive, but the language about being able to assign it to another third party is not currently part of the rights we are seeking. Roselle, do I have that correct? Because again, we are not going to own the underlying property. Right. But we and are storing so an easement in use. But the owner is, this is a little different than Howard Hughes. It's specifically for electrical purposes. But it's still heart acquisition or city acquisition. So what I'm saying is whatever HECO gets, 
is going to be, we're assigning it to HECO, but their assignment will always be conditioned upon the fact that it's never exclusive without HART's uh, ability to control. I just don't think that HECO should have an easement that we're going through the process of condemning and getting, whether it's not a fee simple, it's a use easement, that they should not have the ability to just use it. Chair. Yes. Uh, is this uh, uh, easement part of the relocation of the HECO system that already exists? Yes. So I, I think that's a little different than, uh, than the Howard Hughes one for that matter is that uh, we are requiring HECO to underground lines and to change their system. Uh, and I don't think Hart, I don't think HECO would really uh, agree to uh, uh, control of that uh, if, if we did it. So I, I see it as quite different in, the, in that we're simply relocating part of their existing uh, grid system. But, but Roger, this is on Puuhale Road. It's not on Dillingham. It's down the road. Yeah. And we're going to step it down mm -hmm. from from a, a 138 kV on a pole mm -hmm. into the TNI property on a HECO easement. Now, I find that different. If it was on Dillingham and we had to underground, I understand that because it's in the rail. This is on Puuhale. Yeah. This is across the prison or wherever it mm -hmm. may be. So we're taking it and then we're taking a line on the Puuhale one, a pole, and then going under, because we have to step it down in order to go 138 kV on a pole underneath. But were it not for the guideway, HECO would not have to do this. How do you know? I'm asking the question. Do you know? Would HECO have to underground on CNI? HECO would not be guideway? They would not be undergrounding the system on, along Dillingham. This is necessary to. But this to isn't connect. Dillingham. This is Puuhale. But this is to connect to the proper to, to the Dillingham line. This is where it's coming from Dillingham and connecting back into the system that's staying above ground. So you're so down Puuhale. You're not undergrounding. So what you're saying is because we're undergrounding all of Dillingham, we've got to underground. On Pu'uhale as well? There has to be a place where that underground feeds into a pole above ground, where it stays above ground. And that's that's this place, that's this property. So it, it from my understanding, it, it comes from Dillingham, tra traverses up Pu'uhale, and then goes above ground on into the poles that are staying. And that this Krista, is the property. I, I know what you're we, talking about, because I'm the one who asked the question about whether, how do you go from an underground to an overhead or an overhead to an underground, because you've got to step it down or step it up. I understand that. I'm just saying, okay, we have this issue and is it necessary for it to be this specific location? You'd have to direct that to an engineer. I don't, I do not have the answer to that. Anyway, that's, that was my issue with this whole thing before, but in any event, Okay, members, what do you want to do? You want to approve this resolution with the friendly amendments that we need to put in to both Exhibit C as well as the resolution that's attached. And I think we need to change both because they're attached. Do we, do we need to change Exhibit C now? I mean, there may be an executive officer here by the time that it comes back around. Yeah, yeah we can leave Exhibit C, I guess. It's going to be a little while before you C. You can just go. remove the title, like you suggested on the other, if, if that's easier. Okay. Yeah. Right. And then, and then with the friendly amendment that uh, our board attorney can go and check whether sequentially we're out of whack. And this is not nine, but this would be something else other than that. So, and we're going to change the attestation to comply. Any any discussion? Any motion to that effect? Both the resolution and the exhibit state. Right. <clears throat> right. For now. <laughs> okay. Do we have a motion to that effect? Chair. 
There's a motion second? Second, Chair. Any discussion, members? If not, do we have unanimous <clears throat> consent with those friendly amendments that we have discussed, including the board attorney's right to check on sequential numbering? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. One, two, three. Two. Okay. Do we have any votes that we need to take? I think the any charge the second officer hiring is the yeah. the pig. Yeah. The pig. And and the job description itself because we need to Okay. Um, either. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So. Members, we're going to lose quorum, so we're going to need to voting quorum as well. So we're going to need to take those items out of order. Um, we will. Where's the uh, description? Is that part of the establishment of the pig? The job description for that, I don't think it's attached. It was in the last meeting. Right. Yeah. But do we have to vote on that? Um, yes. If you want to change it, so we, I think we need to have the discussion about whether you want to keep it. Open oh, I see. Free. Yeah. So, but that would be in the pick discussion. Be, uh, I think actually it would be under committee reports. So, item four C A. Oh, I see. It. Executive session. Okay, I was just looking for it. So let's start first with. Um, and again, my apologies, but we're going to go things out of order to, to make sure that we have the votes. Now, beginning first with item number four on the agenda, approval of the fiscal year 24 capital budget amendments relating to project management expenses and CCUR dash Roman numeral four dash E. So with that, let's begin with um, our finance chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, in the packet, there's a resolution 2023-10, uh, and the resolution is to amend um, the fiscal year 24 capital budget, um, specifically the line item city center guideways and stations um, from 569, from $555 million, and um, we allocate 15.2 fifteen million seven hundred twenty one thousand and forty six dollars to <clears throat> capitalize hearts um salary expenditures and also a hundred million for the electrical work that needs to be um done um in the city center utility relocation and both of those items were passed out of the finance committee <clears throat> the heart um, capitalizing hearts um, salaries were passed out passed out on um, the October 17th committee and the city center utility utility relocation um, September 1st chair hi do you want to make a presentation Brownless deputy director of budget finance uh, I don't have a presentation prepared, um, aside from what uh, Robert, uh, finance chair, has already discussed. Okay. Members, any questions on this? So, I'm so sorry, Chair. Um, Robert, did it pass out of finance, or was it just discussed in finance? Because I didn't have a chance to research that. Um, I, did, I got an email from CORE saying it was passed. It was passed. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any discussions, members? We've discussed this specific matter uh, before, and we've had actually two presentations because I think I asked why Robert was doing all the presentations and not Hart. But in any event, we did get briefed on this. Any other questions, members? Natalie, you have any questions? I guess just the same comment about the board executive officer signing down yeah. there that might need to change. Thank you. We'll change it to the board attorney. Any Anything else? If not, can we have a motion? 
So Michelle moves. Ro Second. Roger seconds. Any discussion, members? With the friendly amendment, by the way, that we're going to change the resolution <clears throat> to say our attorney will sign at that. This one doesn't even say you're attesting. <laughs> Call those guys back. Why doesn't this one have attestation? Okay, members, any other discussion? If not, do we have unanimous consent? We do. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Chair. With the friendly amendment, by the way. Okay. <clears throat> Did I call for public testimony on this? Uh, I don't think so, Chair. Okay. Anyone here to give testimony? Agenda item number six. Anyone on online? No. Thank you very much. Okay. Now we'll go and we'll take these two items um, in order. I mean, both out of order, but I think we can handle it the same. Or maybe not. Let's begin first with the, um, we'll go to committee reports, which is agenda item number four. We're calling out of order sub, sub C, which is the November 2, 2023 Human Resource Committee. So is there anyone here to testify on agenda item number four, subset C? And this is the recruitment and position description of the board executive officer. Anyone? Anyone online? No. So with this, do we wish to go into executive session on this or do we wish to just discuss it? This is the description. Michelle, how would you like to proceed? Well, let me um, just describe to you what happened in committee, okay. and then we can decide if we're going to go into executive okay. session. So in order to expedite uh, the recruitment process, a draft vacancy was circulated in committee and reviewed by the members. And um, we decided that while we would, allow, we, we would like the full board to review it, and I want to apologize, it's not in the package, but I think... Has it been disseminated out? It, it was for the much. committee. I, I don't know. I think yeah, we'll check yeah. on whether it's been disseminated to the full board, but we would be happy to take comments. It was almost that in order to continue the process that we would ask Hart to post it on the Hart vacancy website, as well as ask Corporation Council to continue to work with main HR to uh, grade the position. And that's kind of where we we left it, um, knowing that the board may choose to make modifications. Uh, what was added to the position description was was uh, an attachment that was the uh, the rules changes that were made um, by the board. Uh, I think two meetings ago, right. or maybe last meeting. Yeah, two me I think it was two meetings ago uh, that dealt with the. Uh, board executive officers responsibilities and, and, and their reporting structure. Um, so with that, um, I don't know if, if Corporation Council has an update on whether we were able to get the position graded and whether Hart has an update on whether that vacancy actually got posted. Okay, so that's kind of where we are. Um, the, the second part of that is we discussed uh, whether it would be appropriate to have a, a permitted interaction group, which is the other topic um, on the agenda. And we decided that we were not going to ask to form it out of the HR committee, but we were going to propose that it be formed out of the full board, that a pig to, um, to make some decisions in terms of uh, reviewing candidates and recommending finalists for the position. And so you'll see that later um, in in uh, in the discussion, but chair, if you would like to go into, I would suggest we go into executive session to discuss specifically the hiring um, uh, evaluation as well as the what the position is going to grade out at. Uh, after I since I you know kind of summarized everything, I would appreciate if Natalie had any comments before we go into executive session that you know if she has any comments about it that that we allow her to present those as well. Uh, can I ask what the executive session 
would be necessary for, I mean, do you need legal advice from me? I don't, I, well, I don't know. I mean, the, the question is, is do we need an executive session? I don't know. Do we get a grading back from? I, I can discuss the information that I got back from DHR. I don't think that needs to be I don't think that, that needs to be, because it's going to be attached to the vacancy, right? Right. So, so it's going to end up being public. So I think we should do that in public now. Yeah. Let's do that portion mm -hmm. and then make a decision. Okay. So I guess what we need to know from you, Dan, is, is what the, and just so everyone understands, when we're talking about the grading, we're talking about the, <laughs> we used the word brackets before, but we're talking about the salary range, are we not? Is that what we're talking about? Yes. So that's so that we all understand what's being discussed. So Dan, if you can bring us up to date as to what you heard. Thank you. So the position description is uh, what the HR committee had considered and adopted. Um, I consulted with uh, DHR on this uh, and they reviewed it and said, that as written, this would be uh, categorized as EMO1 uh, rather than EMO3. And the salary range was, I think, something like 88 to 138, but I'd have to look up the exact numbers. Um, they said in order to qualify for an EMO3, it would have to be clear that this is a policymaking position, um, that the executive officer is advising the board on policy and is helping to set policy. Um, so it's really up to the board as to what you want from the executive officer. Did you want someone in a policymaking role or not? Um, and again, I think that conversation can be public. Mm -hmm. And if you want to add uh, any language to the position description, again, we can do that, I think, in a public session. So what's the, the range for an EMO3? Uh, I believe it goes up to 152, but I'd have to double check the numbers here. And it's the bottom side of the bracket, uh, so little, to speak. It's a little higher. Um, but yeah, let me see if I can find the numbers here. So members, why don't we have this discussion in public? And so the question is w whether uh, we are going to now look at this, the replacement of, um, uh, of Cindy and what level uh, we are going to place this person at EMO, EM1 and EM3. So the original description, which Michelle did circulate to all of us, uh, and we did get it when we got notification of the uh, HR committee meeting, was uh, according to Dan, when it was reviewed by the city's human resources, it said that the, the range of the the amount that the person could get paid is 80 to 138 because what we lacked in our description was the policy uh, making, well, policy advice that the person can give. And that's part of the decision of this board as to whether you want an executive officer who can give policy related decision, you know, uh, opinions to us. And I have the exact numbers if you'd like, okay. Chair. So for EMO1, the range is 87108 to 139368, and EMO3 is 91024 to 153672. So about 4,000 higher on the low end and about 14-ish higher on the high end. Yeah. And this is just the range. We're not saying we're paying the low or we're paying the high. It's the range to give the, the board um, and or the pig, uh, uh, which may rec recommend to the board, uh, the flexibility to find someone within that range. So the discussion is open among the board members as to what you believe. Um, and, they, and it's going to hinge on whether or not the the policy related issues are something that the, the executive officer uh, should and can engage in. Sure. Yes, Kika. So just clarification then um, in your discussions with HR, is it policy making or policy advising? Uh, that is a great question and I'm not sure, I, I, I don't know is the short answer. Um, I think advising is probably enough, but let me go back through my notes and see if I can find. Any, Robert? Oh, um, you know, I, I would just, it was, 
as simple as I, I would rather have uh, have it as an EMO3 position um, that the executive officer are able to give policy advice. It just gives us more flexibility in the type of um, person that we're going to hire. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Roger. Um, looking at the uh, requirement there for the knowledge base required, I think it would be unlikely that we would be able to recruit an employee who wasn't already an employee of the city, uh, uh, given given the need for a detailed knowledge of all of the city policies and all of that. So uh, that, I think, would restrict our ability to appoint somebody, and it might be uh, it might end up being opening an opportunity for someone who's already an employee. Uh, and I'm not, I just bring that up as whether that is the, uh, the desire, because I don't think that it would be likely that uh, a non-city employee would have a, uh, a, a extensive experience and in-depth knowledge of heart and CNC policies. Yeah. Unless it's someone that occupied the position before. Uh, unless it's someone that has either occupied the position before or is perhaps uh, uh, some type of uh, administrative service or administrative employee within the city system. Can you scroll to the required um, skill set? I think that's a real good question on whether we want to require that you, right, uh, under required qualifications or to put that under desired. So um, when I wrote it, it said effective interaction with high level policymakers, being able to do policy, but didn't specifically say it had to be city or heart policy. It had to be, they had to be, they had to understand how to do it, but you know, they could learn how to do that policy. It was a, it was a desired skill to have this, you know, you know, to have that additional um, city or heart policy uh, skill set qualification. Um, and Chair, if I may, I have an answer to uh, Vice Chair's question about um, policy making versus recommendations. So what DHR had advised was that in a previous draft of the job description, there was some language about researching unique and sensitive topics, analyzing alternatives, and making policy recommendations. And so that language should be reinserted um, and made more prominent if that is what the board wants to do for the position. Um, but they did say it was about making policy recommendations. So it does not have to be making policy itself because that is the board's right. function. Thank you. Sorry. Go ahead. Chair, as a follow-up. So when you consulted with HR, what what did they base their recommendation off of? Was it off of what we see up on the screen right That's now? That's correct. Yeah, it was off this job description. Um, and they said this one is um, solidly an EMO one. And that if you wanted, um, again, if you want someone who's making policy recommendations, then it could probably qualify as an EMO three, but it's a different a, a different job description that the board would have to consider then. I mean, so not, in the first paragraph, I, I noticed that it 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 referenced uh, giving counsel to the board. That's that doesn't that's not sufficient. I think it was a matter of um, the sort of core functions of the job. If that's an sort of an afterthought or whether it's a prominent feature of the position that they're really looking at. So the recommendation is if the board wanted to um, entertain an EMO3, that we'd have to make some adjustments to the... To, to what's on the screen, that's exactly right. Okay, all right, thanks. So Dan, so we're clear if we, if the the language that you read about researching and making recommendations, that would be sufficient to put us into an EMO3. Um, I think it might be sufficient, but I think it's really the fundamental question is what does the board want the position to be? Um, and if you want it to be a policy making, I'm sorry, policy recommending, recommending position, um, then we can rework the job description to say that. Um, but I think I think it would be better to think about it uh, from what do you want and then write the description from there rather than trying to get the job description to fit into another category. Well, I mean, I kind of wrote it to 
policy recommendation. So I kind of am. I speak wrong. I, I, I mean, if you look at the last thing under required, it says demonstrated ability to undertake in depth research on complicated policy issues and provide comprehensive recommendations. Now, I the way that it was written, it was not to direct policy, okay? But it was intended to provide the board um, a, a plethora of research on what policy is out there and potentially a recommendation to the board if there was one. Um, so uh, I guess we can focus on that a little bit more, but just so everybody knows, I mean, I kind of figured people that the position was going to do that because that's what they were doing before. You know, I mean, there was not, it wasn't like I tried to take it out, but like clearly we can um, focus on the core function, uh, that core function and put a lot more um, detailed language if the board agrees um, to try to beef up that topic because I think it probably wasn't as clear, you know, to the DHR. I mean, clearly it wasn't clear to DHR since they graded it in EM01, right? So we can fix that. I mean, as, as long as everybody thinks that that is appropriate. So I guess the first question that we should all uh, debate and decide is, do we want uh, a person who we could negotiate and potentially pay at an EM03 level uh, versus uh, just at an EM01 level? I guess I think that's the first thing we need to have some kind of a consensus among among us. Uh, you know, personally, I like the widest latitude because who knows who will apply. All of a sudden, you may find somebody that's great who who won't take a job for less than hundred fifty thousand. I mean, who knows? And that seems to be about the the going rate now. I think was it you, Roger, who was making that statement about what you thought the executive. Uh, director kind of positions was, uh, I guess, requiring or being paid within the city? I, I, I thought we had a discussion similar to that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I did look at other positions. Project as complicated as, as, as it is and, uh, and looking at what other commissions and boards uh, that do have executive officers pay. And I the uh, three level was more appropriate, but that's, uh, you know, that uh, was, uh, you, I think that the, the salaries have gone up. The other issue too, that I think we should uh, uh, understand is the range is large. It's a uh, 50% or more range. And so it's the, uh, uh, you know, in choosing uh, a candidate, uh, the extent to which we can recruit above the minimum uh, would be a factor too in what what we think the the uh, the salary level should be, and I, I'm not sure whether the council has any uh, opinion on, on our the range above the range. So uh, what I understood from DHR is that the the job description determines the range, and then it then when an individual applicant comes in, their individual experience and qualifications would determine where in the range they would fall. Um, so that's sort of the, the two-step yeah. process. Yeah, so I, I think that does give flexibility to the board. And I, I guess if the question is, um, is the executive officer going to offer policy making advice as opposed to other things. Um, I think that we should have that discussion uh, as to what type of policy making advice would we envision uh, that we would expect from a board <coughs> officer, if any. Any other discussion? Um, I guess sure. what I would say is in terms of where I saw the executive officer making that kind of advice is even small things like, you know, like we'd be sitting in a board meeting and we'd say, yeah, we wanted to kind of like the, uh, the, uh, the rules, for example, we want to feel like this and you get, you know, six set of comments, but then what they do is they take those comments on the policy changes we're recommending and actually write them down into uh, something that fits most of the comments, right? So they're making this recommendation into how we're gonna actually change our rules 
our, our policies of how we run our board itself. And, and that's what they did, right? They took our comments and they put them in and they said, okay, I, I adjudicated it basically. And I tried to put most of these things in. And I think there's many examples where there was that kind of um, discretion and adjudication on um, sensitive documents or policy documents that we've had our previous executive officer doing. Um, and, and I wouldn't expect them to, to, I would expect somebody to keep doing that, right? Um, I, I, I mean, I look at the bottom of the range, it's only like $4,000 difference. So it ge does give us a much wider range on the top end to hire somebody if they have those skills, right? And I, and I like that, but I wouldn't expect somebody to actually um, interact with high level policy makers on behalf of the board, right? It, I, I, that, that, that I, I would, uh, restrict to only board members and only on behalf of the board and what they have what we have agreed that they can they can accomplish they would not be um, responsible for doing that and I think we probably need to make that explicit too uh, now that I think about it any other comments yes yeah, chair my, my only comment and <clears throat> the reason I, I asked the question I did earlier was to Michelle's earlier point the way I read the description now, I mean, it, it sounds like um, the intent was for this position to provide some level of counsel and advice to the board. But with that said, this is what DHR based their recommendation on um, for an EMO1. So, um, I mean, I kind of, uh, agree with Dan's, you know, we should base our decision on what we want the position to do and where it falls is where it falls versus trying to fit the description into a particular uh, category, um, range, salary range category. And, and I guess my only my only concern is that based off of what was given to DHR, their recommendation came back as an EMO one, and 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 I read this as um, clearly clearly saying that this position provides input and advice. I I, I would be a little concerned on where we draw that line, um, where this position um, might go a little bit too far in in, in adjudicating uh, issues that are, are, are decided on by the board. Uh, and in the past, there has been instances where um, resolutions that were approved by the board, um, the final draft weren't exactly what was approved by the board. Those kinds of concerns I would have if, if we're given if we're giving too much latitude to this position to use their discretion, uh, I would be concerned about that. Chair, uh, sure, if I may, I just wanted to mm. thing. I just wanted to make clear too that DHR was giving me sort of an informal view of the position um, that once the board finalizes it, then they have several steps that they need to go through before they finally settle on the category. But that that was their initial take was the EMO one. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Edwin. I think we we had earlier discussed that no one person can do everything, and that we would probably be uh, after the executive director, uh, officer is appointed that she or he would need support staff and additional people. Uh, so I, I took a different approach. I took what. Michelle had and broke it into a career ladder that would support justifying three different employees being hired at different le levels. So it would create a career ladder, so to speak, for the individual. Um, and by breaking up what I consider the chief of staff position into three different positions, we have a progression that would justify paying the salaries that we anticipate to be paid. Um, 
And because as it stands right now, you're basically asking for a chief of staff position. No one's going to accept that position for a hundred thousand. You're going to have to pay about a hundred thirty to one hundred fifty thousand to attract what currently MBAs and people with postgraduate degrees do, which is basically being a chief of staff for a member of Congress. Any other questions or comments? Natalie, do you have any comments? No, thank you, Chair. I, I, I believe that um, one, in my understanding was it was a preliminary go through by the DHR, DHRD, and they made a uh, decision or recommendation. I also happen to believe that uh, to have, when you look at the structure of this board and we really don't have support other than that executive officer, and we've all seen it. I, I see it probably more than all of you. I know what Dan goes through to try and <laughs> figure out what's going on. I know what the heart staff goes through when they're trying to just coordinate something like, are we all going to be here? Uh, and, and, you know, uh, things like uh, the agenda, what should be on it, what's going to be attached, what's the sunshine. I mean, I think that's when we really recognized, or well, I recognized how much work goes into that position, especially when um, there was no assistant. But, you know, when I first got on the board, that's exactly what it was. It was really no assistant. And in addition to that, uh, they were once, we had met basically once a month, and our folders were this thick, and that was put together by the executive, who was the executive officer. So given the nature of the board and the fact that this board is, uh, is becoming um, more engaged and has more needs in terms of information that it seeks and so forth, I think that it's critical that we hire someone who is able to address that, know where to get it, and, and hopefully, like Edwin said, can have a career path of others following suit. Right now, I think we, under the budget, um, Robert, we only have one person, and that the way it's written is that the executive officer, we don't get involved in that. The executive officer will hire uh, his or her own assistant. So I think that until we get a better feel for everything, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the executive officer and one assistant. So given that, I would like to believe that this, and, and I've, I've seen the difference between this board and the other boards uh, that I sat on, especially the heart board that I sat on before. This board is extremely engaged and has affirmatively taken action, like, for example, the, the TAT pig, the recovery plan, the pigs, and all of that that we've come up with. And the person who, uh, really who managed to keep us going on that was Cindy. And she had to take all of our input and make something of it. And I think that's really what we're not talking about somebody who just is going to put a and I don't mean this in a negative way, sort of like just type out what we're saying. That's not what, what I'm saying. It's somebody who understands what the board is inclined to, to say or inclined to do and memorialize that in a, in a document. We may not agree, and that's why we all get the rights to edit, and we all take our positions after that. But we need, we need somebody who can do all of that who can understand what it is that this board needs. So we need somebody who understands the functioning of a board, understands where this board's authority comes from, what this board intends to do, and can act accordingly. So I tend to believe that if we need to, Dan and I can go to HR and tell them, you know, we don't think you're reading this correctly. This is what we need and this is what we want. And I think that if we were to do that, Dan, we could probably be persuasive. Um, yes, I also have drafted up a couple of sentences uh, that we could insert. Yeah. And then, so I am for the widest discretion 
that this board can exercise in terms of salary range, simply because we never know. You never know who's going to come to the door and say, hey, I, I'm, I'm the person. Yeah, if you don't know this about Cindy, when Cindy came, she came at the inception of heart. But she was, and this is means something for Roger and me, she was a TriMet for a long time. And TriMet was where James Cowan was originally from. So she knew uh, that system. And uh, quite candidly, coming here from TriMet was very different for her. Well, Robert, you know TriMet too. So it's it, it was very different because it, the structure was... I mean, the board back then had no power anyway when it was first formed. It wasn't until the 2016 Charter Amendment that took place in 2017 that the board actually became a true oversight entity. So I think when you look at that and you look at how it's evolved from before to now, and you look at the, um, and one of the arguments I would make is you look at the pay scale that she was at when she, 2016, and then uh, the description that she fulfilled in terms of the board, and then now, it more than justifies to me the increase because the board has changed by the people of the city and county of Honolulu. That's what they keep reminding people. The board can only change when the charter changes and the charter is voted upon. Of course, now you're not going to get anything that has heart on it through the charter commission or the, the people of the city and county who they vote anything that has heart practically down because that's the way a lot of them feel. But back then, 2016, it was a major, it was a major change to the authority of the of the heart board. So with that, I feel that um, personally. Whatever we need to change, we should change. But I would like the board to support uh, a, a wide range in terms of the salary. And EMO3 seems to be the justified range. And then this board can also decide at that time, because we time is of an essence for us. I watch, <laughs> I watch everybody scramble, and, you know, and I get the drafts. And I know who's doing what. And I'm going, this is, this is insane. This is absolutely insane. So we need to move quickly on this. And whether it's you decide that you want to form a pig so that the interviews can go quickly, um, then that's something else. But that's my my sentiment, and I would recommend that um, we do that. And then maybe recommend that that uh, Dan and Michelle or Dan and I go to um, meet with HR when we have the final description and i don't know what yeah so let me propose that i think dan said he had a couple of additions that he based on his dhr um work uh, oh like you you have them like you want to we can read them yes he oh, has okay. here uh, inserting the following language, the executive officer will research unique and sensitive topics, analyze alternatives, and make policy recommendations to the board. The board is the policymaking body for HART, and the executive officer is critical in providing high-level research and policy recommendations to the board. This would include but not be limited to synthesizing different board members' positions and recommending cohesive policies for the entire board. Sounds good to me. Yeah, I would propose that we add that to the position description and that we allow um, both Dan and, if need be, you to, you know, advocate with DHR for what we want out of the position. I mean, if that's okay with everyone, then we can start that rolling because that's going it, to, it does take time and it does take some amount of time um, to get everything uh, lined up so that the position can even be posted, right? And I think in addition to that, Hart uh, has put a hiatus on the Indeed <clears throat> postings until we procure a service by which we are going to post all of the vacancies. Is that true, Rick? That's true. We have for now. We don't expect that to last too long, but we are still posting on the city's website, on our website. And so forth. So we are still active, but just not yet 
back yeah, then. I mean, it's almost like, because, you know, we don't have our executive officer, so we need to start moving. So, I mean, I would propose that, that I like that change and that the board accept that change and then start the, start the process. Can I also recommend that what we do, and Dan, you can tell me if we're wrong on this, that if and when HR agrees and has the range that this board is looking for, that at that point, the board authorizes uh, you or me or whoever goes to HR and gets the final decision to tell uh, Hart to post. Yeah, instead of coming back to another meeting, right. we do that. Right. So I, my understanding then is that this would be the final position description as approved by the board, where it falls, like which range it falls in, that's up to DHR, and then we go from there and post either way. Oh, and we'll advocate though for our position. Of course, sure. <laughs> and then wherever it goes, then we'll post because we got to get this thing. We got to get a person in there. Chair, yes. Um, yes. Quick question. Um, might be for Rick or for Nate. Um, when Hart um, transfer employees from, say, like a consultant to a city position, uh, um, do we go through this process, same process that you have to get um, DHR's approval and they have to accept the job description and you have posted, right? So for Nate's position, I know Nate um, is now a city employee whereas before he was not so he actually had to interview for the job he actually had to apply he was an appointee so nate didn't so he's not a good example he's an appointee yes. um okay so how do okay so how do we well, determine the person would go through we would post yeah and if there is a candidate we would interview them yeah but how do we decide who is an appointee and who has to go through DHR to go through this process? Could the executive officer. Um, officer of the board, which is to me a very, very important position, could that be an appointed position by the board? Good question. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. So, you know, we, we kind of need to find out how things are done now and how certain positions are being. Um, select or oh, how certain positions are being selected. If there's another avenue that we could go to that's quicker, um, we don't want to discount the HR. I mean, we want the help, but if there's another path we could go on, like I, I actually didn't know we could appoint certain positions. So maybe that's something we could consider. Wait, let, um, let's be clear. So does HR pass on the description of Nate's position and the salary range, and then you appoint. In other words, it's two-step. One is you, you agree to the description and the salary range, and the other, though, is you don't have to maybe interview or go through the whole process, but you can then appoint. I actually don't know the answer to that. So Lori, I guess let's look at Nate. How was Nate handled? Yeah, I know. Nate, maybe Lori Nate, you know how you were handled. Yeah, you're right. So Lori did go. Aloha, Nate Mettings, Heart Project Director. So Lori did go back and forth with DHR to justify the position description and the range. We're not sure whether that happened before or after um, I was appointed, but I know that there is a level of buy-in from DHR for appointed positions too. And they actually have to buy into it being appointed, is my understanding. Yeah, there's, yeah, I can't answer that question specifically. Yeah, yeah, but we talked about this in the HR committee. It was, you have to justify that it's specialized. Right. There's a set number of appointed positions right now. And a lot of those were in, fa in place even right. when. And, right. And I think if it's specialized, it seems like there's a lot of discretion on salary. That there's not like a boundary kind of, oh, the boundary is very, very yeah. wide. I think there's still a boundary, but, but it, yeah. I yeah. tell you this. Yeah. This but I, so I, I, that's why I said, I think this is two, two separate, well, two yeah. steps in the process. I don't think we avoid the HR and the buy-in on the description and the salary range, but whether we then can appoint from the interviews that we have, we're going to appoint anyway. 
right? So it, you know, then then we can just have the interviews, and the pig can if if we do it by way of the pig, which makes a lot of sense because then we can do it quicker, and then you can do it without any, you know, uh, posting and whatever else or personnel matters we might be able to avoid, and then we we appoint from there. How does that sound, Dan Gluck? Sorry, Chair. So you're talking about the pig process. No, no, I'm talking about the two steps. So that we're not going to avoid HR. Right. It looks like even with Nate's situation, we didn't avoid HR. So HR is going to play. They're going to decide on the salary range, and they have to buy in and the salary, and then also mm -hmm. the description. The next step is the selection process, and it seems like Nate was appointed. So I think what that means is that you didn't post. Is that right? Rick, you guys didn't post. You just took this position and you got whoever you wanted and you appointed, right? So, because you already had Nate in mind. But then they had to get HR to buy in that too. So in our case, we don't have a Nate. So we would probably post. still have to post mm -hmm. and then do the interviews. But then the question is, and what I would recommend is that we do a pig. And the pig can do the interviews really quick, and 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 then hopefully, if we can get this all done, maybe by December, the December meeting, we can have an executive director. Who knows? An executive officer. I mean. Yeah, that all sounds great, Chair. Thank you. Yeah. So, we still kind of have this issue of how do you make the position appointed. And, and initially, I thought the, you know, the, I mean, there's six appointed positions at heart, correct? There's something like that. We put an asterisk on our org chart, and we started asking questions about exactly how you get somebody appointed. Like, some of them kind of just come like that, like the, the executive director. And we have not added any since anybody's been here, so nobody knows how to add one. Yeah. Dan, so, so actually... Um, so actually, this is public in information, mm -hmm. and no. that's the reason why I asked the question because that actually came out in public um, through Civil B, and I think you could, um, depending on what your title description is, and I think that's the reason why, you know, Nate's position could be appointed because, um, okay, again, it's public information. Um, the title that's posted is actually the deputy executive director. It is not, um, the title is not project manager. So that's why I asked the question. I think maybe that's the reason why it, it's an appointment. So maybe it's a title thing. Um, yeah, I think it's in the charter and I'm trying to find it. Trying to find the specific provision, but I think there those six positions or whatever they are are specifically enumerated in the charter, and that's why. Charter, if you don't get add one. For to be sort of totally exempt from not totally exempt, but uh, well, thank you. to have that kind of flexibility in the hiring. Yes, I think so. Th this would be done by a personal services contract. So the difference is we don't have a name. So we're not converting a Nate from, uh, you know, uh, HDR to us. So we would have to post anyway. We would have to post. And then we are going to appoint. We're going to make the selection anyway. So I don't think it's the, if we had a person, and I don't see why, for example, if the pig interviews and they come up with just, they're going to probably make one person's recommendation. That's fine. That's one person. If the pig feels that we should have two or three, um, I don't think there's any rule on that, right? I mean, if the pig says this is the person that we believe the board should, should hire as its executive officer, then the board meets and the board accepts the pig's report and we move accordingly. So we got to get through this. I don't think we're going to avoid the description from HR, the range from HR. We're going to have to post because we don't have a Nate that we're going to fill in. And then let's, let's do it like that. And then I think the quicker we get going, the quicker we get an executive officer. So with that, are we kind of in agreement? Are we doing this right?
Uh, yes, Chair, and I did find the charter provision. So the charter in its 6-1103 that talks about specific positions of the transit authority that are, uh, sorry, exempted from the civil service provisions of the charter. And it specifically lists the executive director, deputy directors, private secretaries to the executive director and deputy directors. And then any certified positions that require specialized knowledge in fixed guideway system planning. So because executive officer to the board is not listed there, that's why we can't do it. Right. Like that position. But it doesn't matter. I mean, we'll get, we'll get yeah. the description accepted. We'll post it. We can, it doesn't say how long we have to keep the posting open. We'll yeah. form the pig hopefully today, and then we'll just, um, move on from there. Any quite Yes, Roger. Uh, just, um, I was interested. What provision of the charter was that? Six dash eleven o three. Six dash eleven o three. Thank you. So it's not in seventeen. It's in the yeah. the general parts. I know there was a reference to that somewhere in the seventeen part of the char charter. So yes, it uh, when you post, one of the things people look at is whether it's civil service exempt or personal service contract. What are you going to put on the? I think we're awesome. all personal service contracts. Yeah. That's the problem. Yes, it's a one year. It's it will be a one year personal service contract. And when um, Dan had discussions with DHR, there was like there was no movement. There was we, we, that is what it had to be. I mean, if you want to if you want to fight that, then we can do that. But right now, if you want to post it, that's what's going to be. That's what everybody is. Except that Laurie has a three-year contract, so I assume, and I don't know if any of you have contracts, no? I assume, yeah. Yeah, I don't know why, so that's something we could take up when we meet with Deher. As I can see, you know. It's something could, that our executive officer can help us with when we get one. <laughs> yeah, so we should we should do that, and we should... Right. Should if tell. one person can have that, then why can't other people have that, right? Yeah, I think there may be charter oh, reasons why. Oh, so that okay. means all of them can have it, though. That's what we're saying. Um, if, if she can have a three-year contract, then why can't everybody else who's exempt? Maybe that's a discussion for another day in executive I know, session. Chair. I know, I know. <laughs> well, we're not in executive session. So anyway, we should we should have that discussion. So members... Can we, do we have a consensus on this? So the, uh, what we'd like to do, let's see if I remember this correctly. One, we are going to amend the job description to include that paragraph that uh, I read to you that Dan is proposing. Two, uh, Dan and or myself and or uh, Michelle will go meet with uh, DHR, well, DHERT is the state, so DHR, to negotiate and to come up with what the range will be in terms of the salary and then also the job descriptions and how it justifies it. As soon as we receive that or Dan receives that, Dan will inform Hart and Hart will post it immediately and uh, make it known that this position is available. Did I forget anything? Because the, then the pig is separate. Yes? That covers everything. So can I have a motion to that effect? So okay. Sure. Second. You okay with that, Michelle? Yes. Okay. Okay, second. Move the second in. Any discussion? Okay, do we have unanimous consent on this? We have unanimous consent. Now the related issue <laughs> is the creation of the pig. And uh, that is, by the way, agenda item number uh, 12. Uh, which is um, the establishment of a pig to investigate, review candidates, and recommend finalists for the position of finalist or finalists. So we'll, it can be just so that we know that you could come up, the pig could come up with one person for the position of executive officer of the board. It does permit us to go into executive session, but I don't think we need that. So... Um, I would recommend because I think when we when when we form the pig, I can the na we can name the people right at that time. But we have to form it and name the people. I would um, 
proposed that uh, Michelle chair it, Edwin serve on it, uh, Robert. Anyone else wants to volunteer? <laughs> Roger doesn't want to. Kiko, would you like to volunteer? <laughs> and, and Anthony isn't here, so Anthony gets to be the, uh, or should I serve on it? Should I serve on the pig? <laughs> I should serve on the pig? Okay, Kika and myself. So that's the formation of the pig. Michelle is chair. Michelle, Edwin, Robert, you, Kika, and myself. So may I have a motion for the establishment of the pig? investigate, review candidates, and recommend finalists for the position, finalist or finalists for the position of executive officer of the board. Can no, I have a, So moved. A second, chair. Second, and we, the names are, Michelle, sorry, but you are the chair. Okay, any discussion? If not, do we have unanimous consent? We do, and I did call for uh, testimony on that, didn't I? I don't remember, chair. Okay. I think I did. But anyway, just to be sure, um, anyone here to testify on the establishment of the PIG to investigate, review candidates, and recommend finalists for the position of executive officer of the board? Hearing none, no online. Thank you very much, members. We are losing quorum. I think everything that we needed to be voted on, we voted on. Um, but with that, I'm going to call a short recess because members, lunch is here in the, uh, oh. in the, the, the quote, our lunch room. And so we'll do that in five minutes. Pick up your lunch and come back and we'll work through lunch. Thank you very much. <laughs> we have to work through lunch. We can't afford to pay for lunch. Have lunch enough. Thank you, we're back from the Board of Directors meeting of Thursday, November 16, 2023. We have lost quorum, um, but we will continue and at the next board meeting will be a report of everything that transpired after 12.15 p.m. Uh, I do not believe any items uh, left require action. Even if it did, we couldn't take action, but we can take testimony. So with that, I would ask just on the remaining items, though we'll also renew this uh, request with each agenda item, whether there's any members of the public who wishes to testify on any of the other agenda items. Seeing none, no one online, so let's continue. We will continue with committee reports. So beginning with subsection A, this is agenda item number four. Uh, and it, and we, we did human resources, which is C. So we are going to do A, which is um, finance committee, and B, which is project oversight committee. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify on either of those committee reports or on both committee reports? Seeing none, anyone online? No one online. So with that, I'll turn it over to Robert Yu for the Finance Committee report. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, your Committee on Finance met on Thursday, no November 2nd, and we reviewed the, um, the monthly revenue expenditure reports and also um, took a look at this um, HARDS debt repayment schedule. Um, we did take action to approve a draft of the fiscal year 2025 operating and capital budget um, so that the budget can be transmitted to the city and county administration. Um, there's no action that's needed by the board with respect to the 25 operating and capital budget at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Any new questions, members, about the report? Not, thank you very much. We're now going to go to uh, committee report number B, which is the Project Oversight Committee. Kika. Thank you, Chair. Your Committee on Project Oversight met on Thursday, November 2nd. Uh, the committee discussed and reviewed the September progress report provided by Hart. Um, the 
PMOC report, September PMOC, uh, PMOC report was not available at the time and there were no uh, actionable items on the agenda. Okay, thank you. We already did C. So number, we've got, we're now on agenda item number five, and this is follow-up board members' requests made at the October 16, 2023 board of directors meeting. We will have Nate Meddings and Brent Lewis. First item is going to be owner controlled insurance program or OSEP analysis. Um, anyone here to testify on agenda item number 5A? None? Anyone online? No. So, with that, Nate and Brett. All right. Thank you so much, Chair. Nate Meddings, Heart Project Director, wanted to provide just a brief update on the request for the uh, OSIP analysis. Um, Brent and I got from the provider a loss run report, um, and that outlines the history of OSIP, all the claims analysis, the report. Um, and we have a couple different data points as well. We asked the uh, we asked the OSIP consultant to do a cost benefit analysis based on their history, you know, of what we could expect costs from the contractors versus the OSIP cost to an owner. Um, we have some draft information all pulled together, Chair. I'd like to maybe understand if that's what you're looking for or really, you know, I sent that over just as a start to the conversation. So once you have time to maybe look at it, like to offer subsequent meetings to be set up and we just can continue any kind of uh, OSIP discussion. Also, if you think it's valuable, don't mind presenting that information at some level to the board during a presentation, but nothing's prepared and that is my update. Brent, anything? Uh, <clears throat> no, nothing additional. I think the issue of the OSEP uh, was was really, um, and I think uh, we'll, we may have to do this in executive session yeah. because I think there are some items uh, still pending. And the question was, if you recall, was what was Hart doing to recover and whether mm -hmm. Hart had actually recovered all of the um, sort of like lack of a better description. You had a certain amount of self-insurance that we have to pay. And so uh, we were curious, well, I was curious about what exactly is that and whether Hart has gone and collected those funds. And if not, what was it intending to do? I do know that from your presentation before that you believe that um, the whole concept of OSEP was being renewed or reviewed because now you are not selling workers' comp through OSEP, that the individual contractors had to buy their own workers' comp. I think that was a workers' comp. So the only issue was like a liability, general liability policy. Is my recollection correct? Yeah, that's correct. On forward-looking contracts, we won't be providing workers' comp anymore. The active ones, we have to retain it through segment two opening, but you are correct. Forward-looking, we're not going to include workers' comp. So then the question becomes whether the OSEP uh, program is necessary. And um, uh, once with that workers' comp portion taken out, you know, how much of the insurance still needs to be bought uh, in terms of a liability insurance? I can assume that if we're dealing with mainland joint ventures, it may be different, mm. but for local contractors, I would think that um, they already have their liability insurance in place. But I think those were the areas, and primarily my focus was how much money did Hart not collect uh, that it was entitled to collect? I have those numbers at the highest level. So okay. On phase one, Hart was eligible to collect 144,000 total. Uh, and phase one is the first five years, the first five years of OSIP. Um, of that 144,000 total of phase one, STG is responsible for 120 of it. Um, and I believe that that would be wrapped into this global settlement and we would not pursue reimbursement from that. But so out of out of phase one, which is the last five years of OSEP, 
144 total could be collected back from the contractors. Um, of such, 120 of that is of SDG that we've essentially given away rights to with this global settlement. And then so that leaves about 10 with Hitachi and 15 with road and highway builders. So not a lot there. Now in phase two, which I'm going to assume is the last two years, 2020 to 2025, 2020 to 2025 total that we could collect back is 180,000 with STG holding 106,000 of that. So really what is recoverable in open contracts is about 110, about 70,000. And just so that we're clear, there's a max on the amount that you can collect, right? Isn't it like 25,000 yes. per claim or per incident, whichever way you want to look at it? Yes. So, so even to get to $120,000, I assume that it's a varying amount, not just 25,000, but that's the max that you can claim in terms of their contributions. Yes. Right? That's correct. And so... What we don't have with this, this is their, this is how much they paid or they could have paid, which we didn't collect. But in addition to that, insurance policies paid out, right? Yes. And then I think that was the other thing that we did want to have an analysis as to what is it that we paid out. What I don't also know that I would like you to look at is whether under OSEP, there's, there's, I mean, we're covering them, but is there... If there's any liability that the insurance company um, has a reservation of rights on, for instance, for example, and uh, then with the reservations of rights, Hart gets hit for the the amount. And I'm not saying they did, but I'm just saying if they did, and how much of that do you get for contribute the contribution from the the general contractor or whoever you covered? So in other words, bottom line when you look at all of this is how much is it that Hart was entitled to collect, how much of it was Hart exposed for because of this program, and how much of it did they actually get back from the contractor. That was my okay. reason for this inquiry. Okay. So I'll keep looking at whatever you're able to produce. Okay, thank you, Chair. Members, any other questions or comments on OSEP? And we're expecting it to end in two years, right, probably? We paid the premium for the next two years. Two years, okay. And you're still doing the analysis as the cost benefit analysis yes. of it. Yes. Um, just a quick question. Um, at heart, who who is the administrator of the OSEP program? Is it you, Nate, or Brent, or someone else? It's me. Okay. So, you know, maybe in the draft that um, you put together to send to the chair, um, one of the things you may want to put is um, how many workers' comp cases are uh, outstanding, you know, what are the average workers' comp days loss? And also, um, <clears throat> are there still any outstanding workers' comp cases from uh, contracts that are already completed, like the Keywit contract um, or any of the other contract? But when we see that information, we may have more um, uh, more questions in terms of data to put in that report. Perfect. Thank you. By the way, along those lines, do we have any third party liability on the worker any workers' comp claims? Do you know? I'll have to check for sure. Because as you know, we're technically not the employer. So it's um so we would not get the benefit of the exclusive remedy doctrine of the workers' compensation. So I'd like to know whether we have any third-party liability out there on any claims, because those are going to be your big claims, if anything, except for accidents, people running into our pillars, I guess. Anyone else have any questions on this? Yeah, Chair, this is Natalie. Yes, Natalie. Uh, thank you. So I had a couple of questions, Nate, from the last meeting um, regarding some differences I had noted between the monthly cash um, progress monthly progress report and then the slide presentation and why they differed. Um, 
with the change order presentation that was given, did you have a chance to look at those? I did, Natalie. Thank you. And we have confirmed that the slideshow presentation is correct for contract value, and that's going to be reconciled and reflected in the next monthly progress report. So that was a good catch, but the presentation that Brent put up there has the correct value. So we'll figure out why it wasn't in the progress report and fix that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Anyone else have any questions about OSEP? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Brett, you're still up. The next item on the agenda is item number uh, Roman numeral seven, which is the report on the fiscal year 23 independent financial audit. Would anyone here to testify on agenda item number Roman numeral seven? Hearing none, any online, none. Okay, Brent, yours. Okay. Well, as uh, discussed by Rick in a prior board meeting, um, the auditor's presentation and the draft financial statements to the board was predicated on Hart staff receiving the draft financial statements uh, by the auditor in time for us to review and submit comments um, and then post. Hart did not receive the, the draft financial statements until late last week. Uh, we are currently reviewing and submitting comments with the auditor. Um, the auditors will be ready to present uh, at the very next board meeting in December. But I must stress that uh, Hart is committed to meeting the VFS uh, requirement uh, of submitting a draft financial statement to VFS by December 1st and a board approved financial statement uh, statements by December 15th. Thank you. It's not called CAFRI anymore. What's it called? CAFR? What's it? CFAR? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Is that the December 1 deadline? Correct. Okay. Well, it's really for to uh, submit um, to BFS so they can share with Acuity, but ultimately, yes. Thank you. Any questions for Brett? Yeah, comment, uh, Chair, yes. if I may. Please. I'd just like to request that um, when you make or when the auditors make that presentation, if they have um, the management letter and any journal entries or any past entries that those be included so that we have the full package when we're looking at that draft. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Thank you. Thank you very much, Brad. If my checkoff is correct, the next item is um, Roman numeral 13 which is CCUR traffic impacts. Anyone here to testify on Roman numeral 13, CCUR traffic impacts? Nope, any one online? Nope, Joey Monahan, yours. Good afternoon, Chair and members. Um, thank you for the uh, opportunity to uh, report to the board uh, this afternoon. Um, thankfully, I have no uh, nothing to report uh, in terms of traffic impacts or issues uh, uh, from uh, from last month to this month. No major changes. No major changes. By the way, thank you, Joey, for stepping in and helping the board with their agenda. <laughs> and I know it must be awfully frustrating, but thank you very much. Anyone have any questions uh, of Joey? Even if there's no impacts, anybody has complaints? Yes, Roger. Any, any uh, update on, on uh, whether there'll be any changes during holiday season? Um, right now, uh, we don't. Well, we're we don't see any um, changes uh, in the upcoming holiday. Uh, Everybody's going to work right through because uh, a lot of the construction uh, workers sometimes they get like two weeks off or those kind of things. Yeah, I think we're, we're planning to work through. I'm just wondering if there'll be impact on the on Dillingham uh, during you know after Thanksgiving and during those uh, key shopping hours. Don't know. That's okay. We, can, yeah, we no, can, we can get back to you on this. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I know at the city we we you know we do take steps to try to minimize impact during uh, you know Christmas shopping times. Yeah. Hey, Joey. Yeah. Can I just confirm again that there are no left turns on Dillingham other than um, where Costco is, right? Okay. The only, okay. The only left turn uh, that you can make is on Alcala Street. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. 
Or maybe it's in an area that I'm not seeing. Which intersections? Um, you know, I don't make left turn because I know you cannot, but I do see cars, and when they make a left-hand turn, you know, and so I don't see the sign. Or maybe it's not too obvious. Maybe that's why they do it. I don't know. And that's why I ask. We can we can uh, we can check with housekeeping and make sure that there are no left turn signs uh, posted at yeah especially at the major intersections yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, members. Yeah, I didn't really hear a lot of deliverables today. Uh, Natalie mentioned some items with the financials, and that'll be included in the next presentation. We talked about some discussion items that you would like to have around operating costs or maintenance costs as we get to handover of assets, but I don't think there was a, a real deliverable around that. It's just something that'll come up for discussion. And then OSIP, I don't know if there was any other deliverables on that. I know we mentioned a report from Brent, but um, is that something we should list as a specific deliverable? I think, I think um, I've asked for like, uh, they're, they're gonna give me a cost benefit analysis, the issue of whether there's any third party liability for heart and workers comp claims. Um, and that's, you know, that's an analysis that they're gonna do and whether the, there's any third party liability on, on, on Hart's part for any insurance that was proceeds that were provided on a reservation of rights kind of situation, and that could go back to the contractors. But bottom line is, you know, we shouldn't be paying any more. And the, if it's the contractor's liability, the contractor should pay. Okay, so we'll add that as a follow-up item. Is there anything I missed? Anything else anybody noted as a follow-up item? Natalie asked for something regarding, I thought, the, uh, the, the report. Oh, but that may not be something that you can handle. It's, it's when the auditor comes before right. the board. Uh, part of the auditor's yeah. report. But that, that should be a, considered a deliverable. Any, anything else, anyone? Hearing none. Thank you very much. And that brings us to adjournment. But let me go back and check because we went all over the place on this agenda to accommodate Anthony plus uh, the fact that we would lose quorum. Did, did you see anything that we no, may have missed? We got it all. Okay. With that, members, thank you very much. And this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Anybody making turkey? <laughs> <laughs>